there is a, a, a very good reason why the Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, and that is because the Trinity isn't biblically based. It's not a biblical doctrine at all. It is a man-made doctrine. It came about from the reasoning of people over a period of time in about the third century. In the third century, a man called Tertullian, he started to defend his views on the Trinity. And by the time we get to about the fifth century, it was basically accepted by the church at that time. The reason that we're discussing this subject tonight is because the idea and understanding of the Trinity dishonours God and it also dishonours the Lord Jesus Christ. This is an extremely important subject. If we really want to know the love of God, if we want to see the love of God and understand who God really is and who the Lord Jesus Christ is, then we need to understand why the Trinity isn't true. To bring God down to man's level and to elevate Jesus to God's level totally undermines the whole process of God bringing man back to himself. And, of course, that is the reason why the Bible was written. The Bible was written so that God could bring man back to, back to himself, so, he could, so man could understand who God is. God desperately wants to bring man back to himself and to have fellowship with him, but he will not do it on the wrong basis. He wants people to understand who he is. Now, God cannot even look upon sin, and yet if we believe in the Trinity, then God became sin and subject to death, which totally dishonours God. Now, the Catholic Church will go to an extreme and say that Mary is the mother of God, and they would reason that Jesus being God and Mary gave birth to him, thereby sheer, there, uh, from, by sheer logic, then, then she becomes the, the mother of God. And Jesus basically puts up with us because of his love for his mother. Now they claim, and most other churches do also, that the Holy Spirit is God. And so the Holy Spirit or the power of God is separate, but also co-equal with God being part of the Godhead. So God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit are all one, but are separate, but equal with each other, co-equal and co-eternal. Now, when we look at this teaching, we find that it doesn't make a lot of sense. However, the churches will say that it takes faith to believe uh, in this, and only true Christians can have an understanding of the Trinity. And yet God clearly says to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, that he isn't the author of confusion. And so if there is confusion on this subject, and there definitely is, even within the churches there is confusion on this subject. If there is confusion, then God isn't the author of it. And sadly, this confusion started and ran about the 3rd century to the 4th century AD by people who actually departed from the true teachings of the Bible. Way back in the 1st century, the Apostle John says, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, he says, they went out from us. These are these people that left the true church, if you like, the true ecclesia. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. And so these people right back then in that first century, they split from the main church, the main ecclesia, and went their own way. And as a result of that, they went astray from true biblical teachings. And because they not only lost the influence from the main church at that time, but they also mixed a lot of pagan teachings into their beliefs to help their brand of Christianity to be accepted by the people. A man called Constantine, if we look through history, was a, was a he, he wasn't a Christian until a few days before his um, death, but he did so much to bring about this, um, this idea of the Trinity, this merging of paganism into Christianity. Eventually, the church that Constantine 
uh, established uh, became the universal church and spread basically throughout the earth and is known today as the Roman Catholic Church. It's called Roman Catholic because its origins are Roman. And in fact, the Catholic Church is so proud that it can trace back its popes right back to Peter, whom they say was the, was the first pope. I think Peter is going to be quite shocked when he finds out how prominent he was in the Catholic Church. It's also very interesting to note that there is no evidence to show that Peter actually ever went to Rome. There would be more evidence for, of the Apostle Paul being the first pope than of Peter. At least Paul did go to Rome and he taught there and he also um, preached the gospel there and, and died there. Of course, not only were Paul and Peter not popes, but they would absolutely hate to be associated with that system. But when we stop and think about all this, does it really matter? Surely we're all Christians and we should stop our bickering and unify together. Now, personally, I would, I would love to do that. I think that it's a terrible situation. It's a terrible shame that we are not together. Try and imagine what good, imagine the, the good that the Christian world could do if we all got on and we all joined together as one body. It would be an amazing, uh, it would be amazing that, that, that uh, imagine the things that we could, could be achieved by doing that. It would simply be amazing, wouldn't it? But see, the sad thing is, the problem is that we aren't one, are we? In fact, if I was to, if we were to go back to the 14th and the 5th or 14th through the 17th centuries, for me to be speaking on this subject and going against the teachings of the church, it would put my life in danger. And sadly, many people did lose their lives because they didn't agree with the church. In those days, in many countries, church and state were one. In other words, the church had both ecclesiastical power and also political power. And so what the church said was law. And if you broke that law, you were severely punished, even to the point where you would probably be burnt to death at the stake. So I guess we ask ourselves the question, is it important for us just to put our differences uh, aside and, and get on with each other? Well, in John chapter 17, the, the chapter we just read, verse 3 says that it's life eternal to know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And so scripture is adamant that if we want salvation, then we need to come to an understanding of who God is. We need to come to an understanding of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And we need to live uh, the best that we can with that understanding and put that understanding into practice in our daily lives. Now, we are taught by both God and the Lord Jesus Christ that we need to love our enemies and pray for those who uh, persecute us. Putting people to death, sometimes, sadly, women and, and, and also children, isn't showing love, is it? We may be very convinced that we are right on something, but if we are prepared, prepared to break God's law to uphold our belief system, then how can we say that we are truly God's people? We would have become blinded to God's purpose with people. And God says that he wishes nobody to perish. And so we don't have the right at all to judge others. All we can do is try and guide people to the best that we can to help them put them in the right direction. But to put people to death for disagreeing with the church isn't showing love. That is absolutely downright vengeful. And I suspect if some churches were given that same political power today, again, I believe that it would be more than possible that those old atrocities of the past would manifest themselves once again. The love that Jesus taught was to be patient with people, teaching and realising that the truth that we have been given isn't our truth. It is God's truth. 
and we have no right to cause other people pain and suffering because of that. This truth isn't our, our truth, but it's God's. Jesus said, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. But he never taught that if they didn't hear and didn't want to understand that they should be put to death. As Christadelphians, we preach God's word out of love for our fellow man because, like God, we don't wish anybody to perish. So why were some churches prepared to put to death people who didn't agree with them? As I said, the short answer is it was political. It wasn't about upholding God's law because they were prepared to break God's law and torture people to death contrary to the commandment of loving your enemies. It was political because it was a way to keep people under control and build up the wealth of the church. Jesus said he had nowhere to lay his head, and yet some churches are worth millions, if not billions of dollars. Some years ago, um, Heather and I were in a little place called Dernstein in Austria, and we went to a church there that was basically covered inside with gold. It was the most amazing building I've ever seen in my life. And yet when that church was being built, there were people starving to death. And so sadly, money has become more important than teaching God's word, it would seem. Now, I don't get any joy by, by saying that whatsoever. But we can only judge by what we see. The fact that a lot of churches are wealthy shows us their, where their priorities are. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, it says, For where your treasure is, or where your wealth is, there will your heart be also. So the question is, where is our hearts? Are our hearts in God's word, or are we building up treasures for ourselves? Now, if we said that we totally understand God's word, and we study it every day, and we could out-debate anybody on any subject on the scripture, I would suspect that most people wouldn't care how much we know about this book until they know how much we actually care about them. And so we're only here tonight because we care about people. And so because we do care about our fellow man, we want to show from the Bible why the Trinity is so destructive and why it hinders our relationship with God and God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We see there in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, a traditional Trinitarian would use those verses to help prove that God and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit are separate and yet one in the Godhead. Now, as Christadelphians and Bible students, we believe that the Bible teaches that the Spirit is the power of God. It isn't something that can be separated from God. The Hebrew, the Hebrew word for spirit, mainly throughout the Old Testament, is the word ruach. And that is something that is with God. It is part of God. It's not something that can be separated from him. And I'll prove that in a moment. We'll also see that the word ruach, the word, the word, the spirit, the word ruach is in human beings as well, as we see in Genesis chapter 45, verses 25 to 27. Then they went out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. Jacob's heart stood still because he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Now, the word spirit in this word, in this verse is the same word as we saw in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. It is the word ruach. The background to this verse is that Jacob just found out that his son was alive after 
um, 20 years. For 20 years, he basically believed that his son was dead. And so when he saw the wagons come up to collect him and take him down to Egypt so he could meet his son again after that 20 years, it says the spirit, the Ruach of Jacob, revived. And so clearly the spirit of Jacob was part of Jacob as the spirit of, of God is part of God and is not to be separated. If we understand this, then a lot of passages in Scripture will start to make more sense. And so the point being that the spirit of God and the spirit of Jacob were part of them. Nothing can be separated. And so those who insist that the Holy Spirit has to be separate to God need to look at verses like this because that totally proves that the spirit of God was part of God and the spirit of Jacob was part of Jacob. It is not the third person of a trinity. Psalm 33 verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made and all the host of them. By the breath of his mouth. That word breath there is ruah. And we could say by the, all, all the host of them by the spirit of his mouth. Again, that, that is part of God. Now, when we read the Bible, we, we must read the Bible in context. Where people go wrong is when they take a verse and read it in isolation. Everything must fit into context. And when we understand the context of something, 95% of the time we will start to get the understanding of that. It has been said if we don't understand a verse, then read five verses before and five verses after that verse to get the context. Then come back to that verse and quite often you'll understand what that verse is saying. To give an example of this, in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 23 to 30, now I, I was some years ago, um, it was just uh, about 30 odd years ago, um, I was with a friend at his house and the Jehovah's Witnesses knocked on the door and they came in and, um, and they said to him, we could start talking about things, and they said, well, we can prove to you that Jesus Christ pre-existed before his birth and they brought out this particular chapter all these verses in Proverbs chapter 8. And I must admit, at the time, I didn't understand the whole of that chapter. And I thought, well, you know, I didn't know what to think in the end. But when we read this, read this in the context of believing that Jesus Christ pre-existed. It says there, I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning before there ever was an earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth, while as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master craftsman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. You see, if we took those verses in isolation, there is a fair, you know, we could make a fair argument to show, well, yeah, that's speaking of Christ. He must have pre-existed. A lot of people use those verses to show that Jesus existed with God in heaven before his birth. But again, if we look at the context of this, we find that this chapter is a personification of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 1. Does not wisdom cry out and understanding lift up her voice? Are you simple ones, understand prudence, and you fools be of an understanding heart. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. And so clearly it's talking about wisdom. And so, as I said, Proverbs chapter 8 is a personification of wisdom. And so, again, context is everything. Let's look at another example. Let's come over to Colossians and uh, chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, 
in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things exist. And so, again, if we took those verses in isolation, we just took them by themselves, there would be a reasonable argument to show that Jesus pre-existed, that he actually, in fact, created the earth. But, again, if we look at the context, Colossians 1, verses 18 to 22, speaking of Jesus, he is the head of the body, the church, the ecclesia, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him whether things on earth or things in heaven, have he made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. And so once more, if we understand the context, we see that the church, the ecclesia, is spoken of here. Jesus created the ecclesia by his death and resurrection. Because Jesus had no sin of his own, God raised him from the dead and gave him authority over that ecclesia that he built through his ministry. So Jesus has been given the preeminence over everything, whether in heaven or on earth. And through his blood, we have been reconciled to God. And as a result of that, we are part of his ecclesia. Jesus was the image of God because he, because in his mortal days, when he walked upon the earth teaching people about his father, he could honestly say, if you have seen me, you have seen the father because he acted exactly like his father would. Because Jesus was an image of God, Jesus could not have been God in a literal sense. You cannot be an image of something and then be the reality of that. It's impossible. But Jesus manifested God's qualities in his life. Therefore, he was the image of God being God's son. Again, if we understand the context, we'll come to the right conclusion. And so we have seen that the spirit of God or the Ruach of God is part of God, just like the spirit of Jacob was part of Jacob. Now, we're told in Job chapter uh, 34 that if God withdrew his spirit or his Ruach, then all flesh would die because God has put his Ruach, his spirit in us. And so if he took that away, we, we would we would pass away we would die we'd be dead and so that spirit has been given to us so that we can live it becomes part of us until the day we die then goes back to god as solomon says in the book of ecclesiastes ruach or god's holy spirit is not the third person of a trinity if that was the case then we too would be gods which is obviously not true So God uses his spirit to do his will. It was God's will that the Bible was to be written. Why did God want this book to be written? Well, we saw in Proverbs chapter 8, didn't we, that it contained, contained in this book is the wisdom of God. And we see it in God's plan and purpose. And we see it in the words that are written, that are contained in the book of God, in, in this book, God's spirit. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. John chapter 6, verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit. They are life. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water but by water and blood and it is the spirit who bears witness because the spirit is truth and so if we have the we have the right spirit in us the spirit of god's word in us and if we approach god's word with the right mind we will see the truth of god's word 
And so the so the, the, the words of God are spirit because they come from God. And if our hearts are in tune with God, we will see the truth of God in his word and we become spiritually minded people. Now, whatever we do in life, we plan, don't we? If we build a house, we need a set of plans to go by. If we go on holiday, well, that might be a bit of a touchy subject at the moment, but you get what I mean. If, if we were to plan a holiday, um, I know it does seem like a distant memory, but but if we were to go on holidays, we would plan it out. Um, going to school, we, we plan things out. Even going to work, we have to plan things out at times. So bas basically everything that we do in life, we have to plan out. And God is no different, except God knows the end from the beginning. And so he plans according to his desired end. An example of that would be Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. And God speaking to Jeremiah, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And so what God is saying to Jeremiah there is that I knew exactly who you're going to be. I knew the outcome of your life. I knew the struggles that you would have and the pain that you would go through. And God knew this even before Jeremiah was born. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame uh, before him in love. God knew every one of us before the world was even created. He knew about our battles like he did with Jeremiah. He knew our problems. He knew our hopes. He knew our failures. He knew that we would love him and love his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, even before Adam and Eve were even created. I said a moment ago, nobody does anything before they plan it. And so Jeremiah and all those down through history and us and those yet to be born, God knew before the world began. Second Timothy 1 verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before time began. And so we, we see here, don't we, that who has saved us, those people who are going to be saved, God knew who were going to be saved right before time began. He knew that he had a purpose with those people. And he knew that it would all be accomplished in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So everything that we see today was pre-known, if you like, by God before the earth uh, was even formed. And the reason for this is because God had a plan and God has allowed that plan to be unfolded down through time. And God can't wait for that plan to be accomplished, to be fulfilled, because it's the fulfillment of that plan that God is looking forward to the most. When God, as we're told in Corinthians, will be all and in, in, all, and in all, that will be his greatest pleasure because that's when the earth will be this beautiful place that God wanted right from the beginning of time. But you see, if I was to take verse 9 out of context, the verse that we just read, it would sound like that we've all pre-existed, wouldn't it? Which would be ridiculous. But again, if we understand the spirit of the scriptures and the truth that this book reveals to us, in a sense, we have pre-existed. We have all pre-existed in the mind of God just like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when God sat down with the angels and he planned out everything and God said to the angels right before time began in that sense, God says, I want this one, I want that one, I want so and so over there, I want all these people to be in my kingdom. Now I want you to go forward and I want you to, to make this happen. 
And so God planned it. Everything we see today, down to the last little bit, if you like, God has planned. He planned it before the world began. And so God told the angels what he wanted, and it's been their job to do what God desired, right from Adam and Eve right through to our day today. Right down through to the, the kingdom of God starting. I say up until the kingdom of God starts because God willing, then we will take actually take over from them. We're told in Hebrews 1.14 that, that we, the angels of God, um, ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. And we know that we then take over from them. Once we are given salvation, then God willing, all of us then will take over that work that the angels are doing today. Jesus Christ at that time will be the head ruler in the earth. He will be king over all the earth. And God willing, we will rule with him as the angels rule today. Uh, who are doing God's will by helping us. In that day, we'll be helping the mortal population. I guess that's another subject. But even so, we will be given that wonderful privilege of working with the Lord Jesus Christ in that day. So when we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, that Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world, we know that he didn't exist in a physical sense, like we didn't like we didn't ourselves, but he existed in the mind and the purpose of God. And so we read that he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Again, if we understand the context, we realise that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't pre-exist in that physical sense, but he did in God's plan and purpose, like we have done also. You see, Jesus isn't part of a trinity, but he's the central piece in God's plan and purpose. God knew that Adam and Eve would sin, and so God worked out a plan that would take away that sin, and it involved his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to willingly give up his life as a sacrifice. And all this was done before the foundation of the world. Now, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21, we read these words. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, to make an analogy of this, to make an analogy of this verse, think about this for a moment. If a group of adults had a football match with some preschoolers, and the adults won. We we would think, so what? What's so special about that? If a bunch of adults couldn't beat a bunch of preschoolers, then something would be wrong. I guess it could happen if Andrew Hill and myself were doing it with our dodgy knees, the preschoolers would probably win. But under normal circumstances, the preschoolers wouldn't have a chance, would they? Well, if Christ is God, then so what? What did Jesus actually overcome on the other hand if the preschoolers actually beat the adults we would be in absolute shock wouldn't we imagine a bunch of two three-year-old kids being adults it would be impossible do we see the point if jesus is god and he overcame sin then so what we're clearly told in james that god cannot sin And so what did Jesus overcome if he was God? Well, it couldn't have been sin. It doesn't make sense, does it? Jesus, if he's God, could not sin. So what did Jesus overcome? On the other hand, if we understand in the scriptures that there are two creations, in the Bible. We understand in the Bible there are two creations, the natural and the spiritual, then that will help us to understand some passages that may seem seem on the surface that Jesus is God, the creator of the world. In Genesis chapter chapters one and two, we it speaks about God's natural creation. 
the earth. It talks about God creating the earth, the heavens, the trees, the animals, and all that sort of thing. However, Jesus Christ is also a creator in a spiritual sense because we have been created in him. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice that it says God prepared, that's going back to the foundation of the earth. We are God's workmanship created in Christ. And those good works, were, uh, as it says there in, in uh, verse 10, those good works were prepared at the foundation of the earth. And so we are in Christ. Because we're in Christ, we can do good works, which God set for us to do at the foundation of the earth. So as I said a moment ago, Christ is a creator in a spiritual sense. We are his creation. And as Hebrews 3 verses 5 to 6 says, in contrast to Moses, who was faithful over God's house as a servant, Christ as a son has his own house and we are part of his house his spiritual house, if we hold on to our faith. He has created us through his death and resurrection. Romans 8 verse 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see, we, we saw a moment ago, didn't we, that, that Jesus was the image of God. And people use that verse to show that Jesus is God. But here we're told, told very clearly, that we are to conform to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, the firstborn in Scripture can mean two things. Firstly, the firstborn, uh, uh, the firstborn in a family can mean the, the elder child. And in this sense, Jesus was the, uh, was the firstborn. He was the first child of Mary, even though the Catholic Church would like to tell us that she was a virgin and that she had no other children. Well, scripture clearly states that she had at least four other children. However, the firstborn of creation would be Adam. He was God's firstborn. He was the first person of God's creation. However, the firstborn can also be a title. If we come back to Psalm 89, verse 27, I will make him, notice it says, I will make him, my firstborn. This is something in the future. The highest of the kings of the earth. That's clearly speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in contrast to this, we see in First Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 1. Now, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, the son of Jacob so that the genealogy is not listed according to his birthright. And so what it's saying here is because Reuben committed this terrible sin, Jacob took away his right to be the firstborn and gave it to the sons of Joseph. And so likewise, Adam was God's firstborn. However, because of sin, because of the sin that he and Eve committed, that right was taken away from him and given to Christ. And so Jesus was the firstborn of all creation to be given eternal life, as Acts 26, 23 says. So Jesus took over that title of the firstborn because Adam had sinned. Again, we, if we understand the scriptures, when we look at the firstborn, it doesn't mean he was the first, Jesus was the firstborn over creation. It means he was given the title of the firstborn. As I said before, 1 Corinthians 4.33, God isn't the author of confusion. So I want to look at some verses now that would cause confusion if Christ was co-equal and co-eternal with his father. Jesus said to Mary, this is just after, um, just after Jesus was risen from the dead. He said, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. 
For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, when Timothy wrote this, Jesus was in heaven. He still called a man. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified by his angel to his servant John. Now, Revelation chapter 1, or the revelation, was well and truly after Jesus had ascended into heaven. Jesus at this stage is, is at the right hand of his father, but the revelation still had to be given to him, as it says there. And so how can Jesus be God if God had to give him the revelation? And also in Acts chapter 7, I haven't got a, oh, yes, I have got a quote there for it. Uh, Acts chapter 7, this is talking about Stephen. Now, Stephen was um, a, a um, he was a, an apostle, oh, he wasn't an apostle, he was a follower of Christ. Um, he was stoned to death just before he died. He says this, being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven just before his death and he saw the glory of God. Now, what did he see? Well, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. God and Jesus Christ cannot be the same. This idea of the Trinity is just isn't true. Jesus is clearly separate to God as the Holy Spirit was part of God and not separate to him. Jesus was separate to God. And so Jesus is separate to his father. And the Holy Spirit is part of the Father. There are many more passages of Scripture that we could go through, but let's just look at one more. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28, where it tells us that at the end of the thousand years, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he will reign on the earth for a thousand years. At the end of that time, we're told this. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. That was a quote I, I mentioned a moment ago. So at the end of the thousand years, the Lord Jesus Christ will deliver the kingdom to God and he'll be almost saying to God, I have done the work that you want me to do. Here it is. And Jesus will be subject to God at that time. How can Jesus be co-equal and co-eternal with the Father? It doesn't make sense. And so when we understand the atonement, how God brings man back to himself, um, when we understand that the atonement, we'll understand how God has brought man back to himself together again. This has been achieved by the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. God said to Adam and Eve, if you disobey me, you will die. They disobeyed, so they were sentenced to death. But before they died, God gave them hope through the sacrificial offering that pointed forward to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before they left the garden, God clothed them in skin of a lamb. And this pointed forward to the lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would take away the sin of the world. And so Jesus was born some 2,000 years ago as the son of God and also the son of man. He was that sacrifice that God wanted. He was a representative of God and he was also a representative of man. He represents God's righteousness and character. However, he also represented man with his sinful nature. And so for three and a half years, years of his ministry, he went around Israel preaching the kingdom of God as God's representative. But as son of man or Adam, he also had a nature that was sinful and a nature that had been condemned to death. And so he was crucified as a criminal, not in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of man. In the eyes of God, he died a righteous man, having lived a life in the image of God. And Jesus said, as I said before, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. However, while he was on the cross, he represented, represented everything about human nature. Christ agreed with his father that human nature should be crucified because it was totally worthy of death. And so he went to the cross representing fallen humanity. 
What Christ was saying to God while he was on that cross was that he understood and agreed with, uh, he agreed that God was right in condemning Adam and Eve to death. And because they passed their sinful natures onto their children, they too became worthy of death, including Jesus, including us. Because he too, Jesus, was a son of Adam, therefore possessed human nature, which God condemned. And so Jesus didn't die instead of us. He died as a representative of us with all our weakness and proneness to sin, which Jesus also himself possessed. And so because Jesus Christ died as a sinless man, God declared Christ to be righteous by raising him up, raising him up and giving him eternal life. We don't die because of sin. We don't die because of sin. We die because of our sinful nature. Sin is just an outward expression of the nature that we all bear. Now, we declare God's righteousness when we get baptised. We, in a sense, go to a watery grave. We go down under uh, the water where we cannot live. And so symbolically, in a symbolic sense, we die. However, when we come up out of that water, we are spiritually resurrected. And if we are prepared to do that, then God will look upon us as righteous because we've been covered by the death and the resurrection of Christ. We become part of God's family in Christ. We become new people created in Christ. As I said before, there are two creations. There is the natural creation and there is the spiritual creation. First, in Colossians chapter 1, he's talking about the spiritual creation. And people get that totally mixed up with the natural creation. If we understand these things, it will help us to understand the Bible a lot more. And so the Lord Jesus Christ shows us the justice and the righteousness of God. Is, if there is a trinity and Christ is God, then how would that show God's justice and righteousness? He would be condemning himself. God has a nature that is perfect. Jesus didn't. And there's the point. Jesus became sin for us by taking upon himself our sin. And yet God can't even look upon sin. The Trinity dishonours God because it brings God down to man's level. And it dishonours Christ because it takes away from that wonderful sacrifice that he has done. That creative work that he did through his life, it dishonours him. He is a man that rose above his nature. He is a man that eventually every knee will bow down to. But how dare people elevate him to the status of God? That is blasphemy. And so if we want to be with Jesus in this wonderful kingdom that is coming upon the earth, we need to learn to, to crucify these natures that we bear and do our best to live lives that reflect God and Christ and do everything to give honour and glory to them. And so, in conclusion, there is God, there is the Holy Spirit, and there is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God is using his power, his spirit, through the creative work of Jesus Christ to bring us to his wonderful kingdom. And may that time be soon. Thank you.